Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel and the Active Towns podcast. I'm John Zimmerman, your host, and this week I'm super excited to share this conversation I recently had with Catherine King, the Urban Mobility Manager for the New Zealand Transport Agency. Uh, Catherine has a fascinating background, in, including having spent some time living in the Netherlands and starting her career off in London, England, prior to returning to Auckland to uh, do some work at the city level and before moving on to uh, the national level. So uh, she's got some great stories to tell and I'm super excited to get this started. So without further ado, here's Catherine King. I'm absolutely delighted to have Catherine King on from New Zealand. Catherine, welcome to the podcast. Hi, John. It's so nice to be here with you. Well, hey, um, it's it's really cool whenever I get to uh, I, you know have a conversation with somebody on the other side of the world and and uh, and basically check in and see what tomorrow is going to be like. And you already told me earlier before we press record that it's a beautiful day, so. That's good deal. It's lovely. You've got something to look forward to. (laughs) Why don't we do this just to kick us off? uh, I know you've listened to a lot of the podcast episodes, so you know that I like to have my guests, you know, kind of introduce themselves. That way uh, we we can, you know, just kind of cut to the chase uh, and and you can choose what it is you would like to share. (laughs) So why don't we do that? Why don't you uh, uh, please take a moment and just kind of uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you come came to do this type of work. Sounds good. Um, So I uh, grew up in Auckland in New Zealand. It's the largest city in New Zealand. Um, And I had a real interest in uh, protecting our environment and uh, looked at ways I could enter a career that, that really focused on um, protecting and securing our our environment for future generations. I I did a bachelor of planning here um, in Auckland in New Zealand um, and worked for a little bit, but like many New Zealanders, the the travel bug hit me, and I went and lived abroad. So I lived in uh, the Netherlands for a year and then moved to uh, Tokyo in Japan and lived there for a few years and then decided to do uh, more more education and uh, moved to London and did a a master's um, in environmental policy there. And when I graduated, uh, there were um, very few jobs in uh, environmental policy, but a huge number in transport. So I started out working in in transport in London and quickly realized there um, just what an impact uh, transport has on on everyone's lives and and what a huge opportunity um, transport is in terms of uh, ways we can um, help people uh, to live happier, healthier uh, lives and in doing that, uh, creating a, a better environment for everyone. So I worked worked there in London for um, almost 15 years, quite quite a while, um, mm-hmm. before um, moving back here to Auckland, um, where I've been for the last uh, seven years, um, and really enjoying being back in my own country and and having an impact here. Fantastic. Now, where in the Netherlands were you when you were there? Um, I was in a tiny town called Dronte, which is in the Flavor Polder, the the new um, part of uh, the Netherlands. Um, so very flat um, and a new new planned town. So uh-huh, okay. it was a, a really interesting place to go as someone interested in planning because you could see um, really what new new towns could be like compared to. Uh, the sprawl that we see here in um, in New Zealand. Right, right. What was the the year that you were there, or, or the approximate uh, time frame? Uh, ninety ninety five. I okay, think. so ni- ni- ninety five ish. Mm. Okay, mid nineties. Um, have you had a chance to to go back and visit and and kind of see if that area has has changed over over the years? 
Yeah, I w when I lived in London, I went back a few times okay. and um, it's still very similar, growing up a little bit. Um, I was really lucky working in London to work on some European funded projects and there mm -hmm. they have a big focus on sharing um, of expertise across Europe. So yes, they do. I connected a lot with uh, uh, the city of Eindhoven, that's where I okay. spent um, a bit more time in that, understanding uh, what uh, what they were focused on there. It was quite remarkable compared to at that time working in London that they were um, really looking for the the tiny little percentages of increase they could get in um, cycling and it was um, incredibly nuanced at that point uh, looking at um, for example, the barriers for parents going into town centres and, and um, trying to do shopping and how they could create um, bike parks that um, that had a buggy share system, a push chair share system, um, and, and really quite detailed changes that they had to make compared to what we were looking at it. How can we get... Um, the the first tranche of people to really start cycling. Yeah, yeah. Uh, had did you have an opportunity to actually see the Hoven Ring there in in Eindhoven after it was built? Yes, yeah, okay. I did. Yeah, that was yeah. there um, when I went and had went and visited. Yeah. So for those those of you who are tuning in and, and not familiar with the Hoven Ring is it's a it's this fantastic. Uh, elevated uh, roundabout for for cyclists and pedestrians that basically uh, goes up elevated over the top of a ma very major um, uh, uh, roadway uh, intersection that that takes place and uh, it was uh, speaking of barriers I mean that was one of the biggest challenges as this was such a car centric uh, section and it was outside of the city sitters <laughs> outside of the city center easy for me to say and uh yeah it, it was it's it's one of the signature pieces of infrastructure that uh really has put eindhoven on the map i think so yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah really impressive engineering there and i think um what they're doing now um looking at how they can uh, enable more flow of people cycling and and tackling some of their um signalized intersections for example is really interesting yeah the other thing that they're well known for is the uh the tunnels that they have so the the bicycle tunnels and bringing those to life and so there's some uh, really fun whimsical uh treatments in in their uh their bicycle tunnels that go through their um yeah. the uh, the monty python skit that's gonna that's walk right. this way yeah. uh tunnel <laughs> is, is there so good stuff well that that's so fun to see that now so it, it sounds like when you were in London, you were, were definitely doing uh, some work in this, this arena with active transportation and things of that nature. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. I um, worked my entire career in London in um, active transport and, and safety, um, focusing there um, on really the, the full spectrum of what we do from policy into um, activation, behavior change, um, street design, uh, street um, maintenance and operations. So I had the opportunity to um, understand the, the, the whole puzzle, all the things that have to come together um, to enable um, more people to get out, to ride bikes, to walk um, and to feel safe doing that. Fantastic. And uh, I jumped over to a, a photo here of you and, and your, your, your delightful Linus bike. Nice bike. Uh, wh where's, the, where's the setting for this photo? Uh, that is the uh, Auckland City Centre okay. waterfront redevelopment. It's an area called Wynyard Quarter. 
uh, and it um, started about 15 years ago, a, a big redevelopment from a um, industrial um, heritage that it had. Uh, and our city development agency called Panuku has been doing some incredible work there to uh, turn what was silos and warehouses and old industrial space into a mixed use development. So there's a lot of housing that's gone in there, a lot of uh, big businesses, but they've created uh, beautiful spaces for people to gather and enjoy. Uh, and I was involved in some of the um, cycleway design through that area uh, and um, helping to create um, bike friendly streets through there. Fantastic. And it looks like there's somebody in the background there who's challenging you to a race. She does look like that, doesn't she? <laughs> uh, the, uh, they're really um, kid-friendly streets there, and you can see that she's um, she's really going for it on that bike. Um, <laughs> Why not? Uh, she's having a ball. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> exactly. So you you sent me some some photos that uh, also uh, you know sort of speak to the the history of um, of New Zealand and of the area. Um, it's I, I in in scrolling through some of these, it really brought back for me that um, you know in the the early early stages of the automobile, many cities around the globe, around the world, um, you know, really we saw lots and lots of bikes, and so I don't know the exact date of this particular one. I sort of guessed based on the, the, the cars and, and knowing a little bit about uh, uh, what cars looked like back then, somewhere in the late 19-teens, 1920s, somewhere in that range. Yeah, that's right. And just look at all the bikes. So talk a little bit about that historical context of, of riding a bike for everyday purposes in New Zealand. I think we have a history that would be really familiar to a lot of your listeners in North America. Uh, you're right, at the turn of the century, uh, people um, uh, got around to work their uh, school everyday journeys um, by bicycle in, in, in really large numbers. And uh, this picture from Christchurch um, is really representative of, um, of the city and of the experience that many people had. Uh, New Zealand cities were um, planned out as uh, tram suburbs, so it was really the investment in, in tram networks across our cities that um, was the first uh, big development outwards from, from the hub, the, the city centres. Um, and uh, it, in that um, period up to about 1950, the vast majority of uh, trips that people made were by tram, uh, on foot, by bicycle. And we had some of the highest public transport use um, of anywhere in the world, some of the most ex extensive uh, tram networks. And, and as we all know, the combination of a great public transport network um, and, uh, and cycling, walking friendly streets um, enables most people to get where they need to go. But with... With the uh, 1950s, uh, 1960s, um, we saw the same sort of development patterns um, as many North American cities uh, here in New Zealand. Um, an extensive um, rollout of, uh, of motorway networks and um, suburban sprawl. So this um, picture that you can see here of uh, of the typical bike parking outside um, a school um, in New Zealand where uh, a good number of people were, were riding right through to around the 1980s. And we saw a, around a, a third to a half of people um, accessing schools by bike. 
um, and and that started to shift as as people lived further from from destinations, and as we saw um, a really steep increase in the volume of traffic on our streets and. Um, parents starting to worry about their kids traveling so then driving their children and that vicious cycle of more people driving and streets feeling less safe and, and so fewer people uh, walking and cycling so we now have um, in our towns and cities um, some of the most uh, car dependent places um, in the world uh, where where many people have no choice other than to um, get in a car. Um, and in this photo here from Christchurch in the 70s um, was a, a parade uh, that happened. And it's, it's really, um, until our recent Renaissance, uh, some of the last um, periods in which we saw um, a good number of people uh, getting around by bike. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting too that one uh, the car the the bike park area um, that we saw there it, it it kind of looked like it was probably from the nineteen fifties or nineteen sixties. Uh, it wasn't dated that I could tell, but I looked at the bikes and I saw some of the the, the handlebar frames and it it kind of looked like one of my first bikes <laughs> with that particular design with the swooping um, things. But yeah, so. Um, Lots of of car centric design, and so you know, as you mentioned, we and I'm going to pull up a photo here. Um, so, a, a typical looking street, <laughs> and, right. uh, and and cars, and 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 you know, obviously a, a quite generous amount of pavement there. I get the sense though that you sent this through because there's been a, a bit of a treatment to this. Is that correct? Oh, I actually sent this through um, for the opposite reason oh, to show okay. you perfect um, to show you the average um, arterial street in yeah. New Zealand, and and many of our arterial main streets are, have this typical width, um, just over twenty meters wide, um, and the vast majority of that space um, is uh, utilized for uh, either parking or or moving um, car traffic uh, and and then you can see the the quality of the rest of the environment the the footpaths that aren't terribly well maintained broken up by by driveways and lack of priority um, uh, to cross the street, for example. Um, but hopefully what I'm sure many of your um, viewers will see uh, is the opportunity in that street, um, is that space that, that we can uh, reallocate um, to give a, a fairer, uh, more equitable use of the spa space to, to invite more people to um, access that that street um, and to ensure everyone has the ability to get around and, and meet their needs. Yeah. So you had mentioned that your previous, in your previous role, you were involved uh, at, at the city level, the municipal level, trying to, to build these things and, 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 and put them. What was that experience like coming back to the country from, uh, from London and diving deep into that? I left London just as it was reaching, I guess, a, a tipping point um, with with networks starting to grow across London of, of safer, quieter streets, and and they were um, starting to roll out the superhighway system in the second tranche where protected cycleways were starting to get delivered. Um, so you could see. Um, the that they were really starting to take off in terms of the number of people um that that could ride and of course we've all seen um the videos and and pictures of london from the last couple of years where there's just phenomenal phenomenal numbers of people um that are out by bike so i, I had seen i think and had that experience and worked on projects to um, to have the confidence that you could uh, really transform a city. So I came back um, to Auckland and, and felt um, 
that sense of what was possible. Um, and shortly after I arrived back, the government announced a um, significant increase in funding for cycling projects um, in a program called the Urban Cycle Fund. Uh, so we went from in Auckland, for example, investing around uh, five million um, dollars every couple of years um, to to do little changes to um, Auckland Cycle Network um, to a real commitment um, in investment, and and we went from 100 million um, to 300 million um, in a really short space of time. So there was a, a really firm uh, commitment to seeing urban cycle networks uh, delivered. Um, and, and this picture here uh, is a demonstration of that. Um, this is Key Street, which runs along uh, the waterfront from, from the earlier picture um, all the way um, along the coast to the eastern suburbs. And, this um, was one of the, the first um, projects that we were able to get uh, delivered. Um, the first iteration that you might have a picture of um, was the reallocation of the street space. And, and this one built on that to create the, I guess, the, the final permanent um, uh, scheme that sees, uh, as uh, as you can see there, rain gardens right. to treat stormwater, given it's right by the, the waterfront, um, great um, uh, allocation of separate space for people riding and a footpath, um, and uh, here we go. <laughs> Um, and uh, it was really a, um, a great demonstration of iterating and um, improving a street over time. So this first picture here um, demonstrates the, uh, the, um, the fast street space reallocation we were able to do by um, reducing lane lanes for traffic so the turning lanes were um, reallocated to and the bit of car parking to create this safe separated space for people riding and it became a really early demonstration really visible demonstration of uh, how many people ride when you create that nice um, separate space where previously um, people were either on on that footpath you can see um, to the left of the photo or um, having to uh, ride mixing with with traffic and pretty um, scary traffic. That's that's a route um, that large vehicles, large trucks use to access the port. Right. Yeah. So, uh, what was the approximate uh, time frame of this one? What year was this? Uh, this was twenty fifteen. It was a project that we were able or we had to get in really quickly before uh, a big um, underground train project, the City Rail Link, kicked off. Um, so if we didn't meet that one year deadline, we we weren't going to be able to um, utilize that space because of all the traffic management that would need to be in place for um, digging out the tunnel. Uh, so this one um, really, I think, proved that we could do things quickly um, by reallocating street space um, and also making it um, an aesthetic improvement for the street with the um, nice planter boxes and things along the street. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this is definitely, you know, in that era, you know, about seven years ago that, uh, you know, the protected bikeways are, are you know, Basically, that's the goal. We, we need to be able to get that protected and separated uh, facility down. We, we've, we know that just having paint alone is not going to, to do it. Um, but then again, <laughs> when you start doing things to this level, um, it gets a little bit more challenging and you start getting some pushback and some uh, challenges. Mm. And so, uh, so what's going on here? <laughs> So in that era, you're, you're quite right, around sort of 2015, 2016 um, is where we really first started street reallocation yeah. um, in New Zealand in our history. Um, 
we we we've delivered a lot of um, shared paths through parks and along waterways. Um, but really it was the 2015, 2016, where we started um, to shift to protected cycleways um, and reallocating of space. Um, interestingly, the I think the painted lanes probably sitting outside of car parking that not many people um, want to use, they, they didn't seem to elicit the same um, uh, reaction from people. But when when we started to reallocate street space, and, and this is a, a picture from a project in Wellington, um, we had similar ones in, in Auckland, um, in Christchurch, um, people, um, people didn't like that level of change. And there was a, a small, um, so we know from our, uh, our surveys that around 60% of people um, in, in New Zealand uh, would ride if they felt safer on streets. And then around 75% of people um, welcome and want to see uh, a cycleway network within um, their city and their area. So this um, very, very loud group of people actually represents a, a tiny proportion of our communities. Yeah. But they're very organized, they're very active, um, and uh, they can, um, yeah, they can make themselves heard in a civic setting in um, meetings, uh, civic meetings, and, and um, a lot of people in this context do know how to um, work within our system. So uh, creating um, uh, a lot of emails and, and making it, um, I think, for our politicians and, and senior managers, making them really question if this is uh, something that people want to see. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we've we continue to see that um, and particularly where a cycleway is reallocating space through a business, um, an area with businesses, uh, a main street and so forth. Um, but uh, as as we're starting to see um, more people uh, cycling, I think that's growing the confidence in in our politicians and our senior managers. Yeah, yeah. So you did that for a few years, <laughs> but you have a new role now. So let's talk a little bit about your new role. What, what are you doing uh, these days? I now work for Waka Kotahi, which is the New Zealand, um, the National Transport Agency. Uh, so we're the organization um, that uh, funds and supports investment in, in all transport, but the area that I look after, walking and cycling across, across the country. Um, we also roll out policy and rule changes. We're responsible for a lot of the guidance and policy at a national level. Uh, we maintain um, and manage the state highway network that runs through the country. Uh, so within that organization, um, I uh, manage the urban mobility team that's looking at how we can create um, vibrant, thriving, um, healthy towns and cities across the country. Uh, and it's been um, a really great experience going from working at that city regional level. And I think, um, as I'm sure many um, of your listeners have experienced, um, coming up against uh, barriers within the system that make it really hard, um, make it challenging to um, deliver at pace, at, like at the pace we need to now deliver um, to hit our climate mission, our safety goals. Um, so there was a lot of things that um, frustrated me, I guess, when I worked at the, the regional level. And at the national level, um, we're able to address those things. So I've, I've in the last couple of years, kicked off a, a number of rule changes, policy changes, um, and funding programs that, that look at how we can make our towns and cities safer and more livable at a much faster pace than we had been in the past. 
It sounds like you uh, you went from you know being in the fight, you know, at the local level trying to implement to uh, becoming the funder <laughs> of some fun things. Right, right. And yeah. so, speaking of some fun things, uh, <laughs> you know, this is uh, this is sort of the the, the website here, uh, your your website, and so this is one of the programs, not you know, not a complete encapsulation of it, but streets are for for people or streets for people. Talk about this uh, this initiative and this program. Um, there's just some amazingly rich things and in, in, uh, initiatives that you have in here. Oh, great, thank you. Um, so Streets for People, um, we launched uh, two years ago now. It, it started out as Innovating Streets and we've adapted now to Streets for People. Uh, it's a program that's looking at um, growing capability in tactical urbanism and testing and trialing changes in our streets um, and uh, removing some of the, the national barriers that exist to doing that. So for example, uh, last year we changed our national rule around uh, what we're calling roadway art. So we had really strict rules around what you could paint um, on a street. And we um, we removed that rule for for slower streets, low risk streets. Um, so streets where uh, we can utilize um, art or um, other techniques to get traffic speeds down to thirty kilometers an hour. Um, we can now paint um, images and patterns that really reflect and celebrate a local community and a local culture. We're also looking at things like um, enabling more events in our streets, appreciating uh, the opportunity that uh, events can play in, in shifting people's uh, imagination about what streets can be used for. Um, so we're looking at guidance uh, that well, that um, we tested last year and launched this year uh, that um, takes away the requirement for traffic management for um, low key events. Um, the program uh, has funded uh, 80 projects across the country uh, and supported people working in councils and, and consultancies and communities um, with a whole lot of uh, support and mentoring and guidance, um, building up a community of practice of of around 350 people across the country who are now involved in rolling out uh, uh, pilots, changes, tactical urbanism type projects in their towns and cities. And the next iteration of the program is going into working much more intensively in a couple of um, places to really um, tackle the processes and, and um, support capability build in those cities. Um, this picture here is from a town called Whanganui that um, unlike a lot of towns in New Zealand, has retained a lot of their historic uh, buildings. So it has beautiful fabric, um, great uh, architecture um, in, in the building surrounding the streets, um, but a street that was once very um, dominated by either parking or traffic. Uh, and they worked with uh, the local artist community. It's a, a town that's really well known for a, a very thriving artistic community. Um, and they they designed all sorts of amazing details in the streets. So the artwork that you can see there painted on the ground through to um, the uh, structures um, that that um, enable covered seating, um, the lighting in the street. Um, so some, some really fun and creative details that have uh, created a street that's um, really attractive and welcoming to the community. 
Um, and it's it's been hugely successful there with the local business community and is is kicking off um, a revitalization there where there's now new businesses moving in and they're asking to not have parking outside their business. They want more tables and chairs or um, or planting or, or something that makes um a better use of that space outside their shop so it's been a real success story that project yeah beautiful beautiful um streetscape there and 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 beautiful old historic buildings Uh, about how large is this city uh it's around a hundred thousand people so a, a pretty um yeah a a sort of average size town in the new zealand context right right so when, and it, I, I guess it's a, a appropriate to talk a little bit about scale. When you when you look at some of your bigger cities, um, what are the population sizes of these cities? Uh, so Auckland is um, by far our largest city. We um, we have a, around one and a half million people, uh, and it's. Um, a large city, so it's sprawled quite um, quite far outwards. Um, in Auckland, there we're growing. Um, pre-COVID, we've we've not had a lot of um, uh, immigration in the last couple of years, but before COVID, we were growing at a, a really significant rate, um, adding around 800 new residents a week. So, so. Um, growing at a rate that was pretty challenging on on housing, services, transport in our city. Um, and uh, and so we've seen a lot of changes here to enable uh, more housing development in the city um, and and uh, much more densification in the the central parts of our our city. Um, Christchurch uh, is is starting to come back after uh, the the population drops that they had um, post earthquake, so they're back to being our second biggest city now. Okay. And then Wellington um, is our third, our capital city, um, and the third largest. Yeah. So, I've never been to New Zealand. I need to get down there and check it out. Um, there's a few reasons why I've I've always wanted to visit, and one of them is that I grew up raising sheep. Oh, <laughs> so great! They're a very familiar. To very us. familiar. I mean, I I know that the the population of uh, sheep uh, far outnumber the the population of humans <laughs> in New Zealand. <laughs> But uh, so that that's one of the reasons. Uh, the other reason is just because I've I've had so many friends that have visited there. I have uh, a few friends that live there. Um, and it, I know that it's an absolutely beautiful, beautiful country. And my sense was that there was a, a, a dedicated effort to try to not sprawl out and, and eat up too much, uh, farmland and, and, and get into the countryside. Um, it sounds like that it's, it, it was probably much more of a challenge a few decades ago. Is the current ethic, you know, sort of really dedicated to not continuing to sprawl out horizontally? I uh, we've had some really significant changes at a national level. Um, so um, our our government in the last couple of years has, for example, removed minimum parking standards. Um, we have a national policy statement that requires um, councils to uh, to enable uh, more dense densification of housing uh, where we need it most so around our um, public transport uh, routes particularly um, but generally across our existing urban areas um, there has been really significant changes that uh, allow people to um, rebuild urban sections uh, with um, in some places up to three uh, houses on on that section in some places much 
much denser than that um, without the same, uh, I guess, red tape or consenting processes that we used to have. Um, so that's really trying to get beyond the um, uh, the not in my backyard um, or the the complaints that we might hear from a few existing um, residents in an area um, and enable development to happen much faster. Uh, Auckland um, already had a, a plan that enabled um, quite a bit more uh, densification. And so we've seen um, significant change in our existing urban area. Uh, and the government established a new um, state house builder um, called Kainga Ora. It's an organization um, that is taking existing um, government owned uh, land and building um, at a really significant pace, much, yeah, much denser housing um, that enables people um, on low incomes um, through to uh, competitive uh, housing developments uh, that are open to everyone um, and um, tenancy opportunities, um, which is really starting to shift housing availability and, and in some parts of the country starting to tackle our, our massive problem around um, housing unaffordability. Um, so we're, we're, we're seeing things moving in the right direction, but there is still growth happening at our edges. Um, so we, we have some way to go um, to completely reduce the sprawl in our cities. Yeah. I uh, put up this photo because I think it was it probably the one of the best photos that you sent to me that kind of gives a vision of, of like from, you know, from a much uh, higher perspective. And so you can see the city, uh, you know, as it kind of stretches out. And, and I'm assuming this is Auckland, correct? That's right. Yeah, okay. um, so this then, is... Then we have um, something very pink here. What is going on? Yes. <laughs> Um, so our city centre in Auckland is um, surrounded by a motorway network. It wraps around the city centre and, and cuts it off from neighbouring um, suburbs. Uh, and, and as you can see there, there's an abundance of motorway lanes and one of them um, hadn't been used in a very long time. Uh, so this was a, an emergency off-ramp um, into the city centre from our, our western part of the city. Um, and one of our earliest uh, separated shared paths along um, the motorway came almost to this point, but there was a gap for people trying to access um, right into the city centre. Uh, so in 2016, um, we uh, worked as a collective from, from three um, agencies uh, to deliver uh, this route um, that includes uh, the pink path, Tiara Efiti, uh, that goes um, from, from the uh, previous bit of motorway cycleway network uh, right down into the waterfront. Uh, and this um, it was really a, a celebration of the city, a celebration of uh, our Maori people. It represents uh, the totara tree, a, um, a tree that used to grow in that area. And there's some uh, beautiful artwork uh, along the path. Um, and it was at a point where um, I mentioned before the government had uh, had got behind cycling and announced a, a really significant increase in funding. And this project particularly was a, a flagship for that, a celebration of this uh, real shift that we, we were going to see in urban cycleway networks. So there was, um, I think it was at a point in our history where there was a lot of optimism and excitement for what was to come. Yeah, I'll, I'll do one more photo here that um, I think is probably from that era as well. Uh, extraordinary, you know, cycle track, two-way cycle track here. Um, and again, having some, you know, 
natural elements to help with the uh, stormwater runoff, uh, you know, gardens there. But then again, <laughs> you can see just how huge the, the you know, the neighboring rotor motorway is. Was this a, um, with this particular installation, was this taking any lanes away from traffic or was this up on the curb already? No, this took a uh, car parking space out okay. from um, the street. It, this is the continuation from the previous image that we were talking through at okay. uh, Key Street. Uh, and um, in the future, this will connect all the way along the waterfront. Uh, the At the moment, it, um, it goes along for about another maybe one one to two kilometers um but it is one of our busiest uh, cycle routes um in auckland uh, and once we once you get beyond the port there which is what that red fence is um you get a gorgeous view out across the water so it's one of our our most scenic and um enjoyable routes but it is the core connector into our eastern suburbs uh, which um, is is really a easy cyclable distance um, into the city centre for people who go there to um, go to restaurants, to work, to study. Um, it's where um, most of our universities are in Auckland. Um, so the the space was um, reallocated from lanes. You can see there's still there's still sufficient there um, for well, everyone else traveling. <laughs> <laughs> um, they have plenty and, of space. We we we, yes. we uh, well let's do this. Let's let's we we drifted our way back into your old world <laughs> there at, at Auckland. So let's let's get uh, more firmly back into uh, you know your current world. So it, play streets. What what's going on here with play streets? So um, in New Zealand, we have. Um, a, a situation for kids that um, is pretty challenging. Um, most children, around seven, uh, only seven percent of children are getting the exercise that that they need to be getting for their own health, um, and um, and we have communities where a lot of people don't don't necessarily know their neighbours. Um, communities where where parents might not feel comfortable letting their kids uh, explore independently and roam, uh, and play streets are an opportunity to to start having conversations about. Um, perhaps what our communities could be like. What would they be like if we were more connected and um, and people were able to get where they needed to go easily? Um, we um, saw a big opportunity with uh, creating space in which people could uh, connect with their neighbours and feel comfortable letting uh, their kids um run around and play, um, but found that the uh, the restrictions that we had, um, Waka Kotahi had um, put in place made that almost impossible. So the traffic management costs and, and bureaucracy that people had to go through um, to shut a street to traffic was very, very prohibitive. Um, so last year, we introduced a, a new um, set of guidance that enables people to shut their street with their bin or um, whatever they might have available. Um, and uh, to do that um, without going through a permit scheme, um, they, there's uh, some easy guidance that, that people can follow that we've tested with communities across the country um, and are really confident that it's easy to do and, um, and fundamentally keeps kids safe um, and, and parents feeling comfortable to let their kids out and explore. So we're starting to see councils across the country introducing these play street programs. And our hope is much like we've seen in, uh, in the UK and North America and, and other parts of the world, uh, that this program, whilst it might seem small and, um, 
and and you might question what the impact will be it's fundamentally going to enable people to rethink what streets are for and question whether continuing to have streets that are dominated by fast moving traffic is is what we want for our local communities so we see it as um an an early opportunity to really start to shift um, our thinking around uh, uh, local community streets and and how they should be designed and operated. Uh, in um, in New Zealand, we have a very um, a very permeable streets for traffic, um, so high levels of short cutting, what we call rat running traffic, going through our residential streets, um, and that forms a, a major barrier to um, people wanting to um, use their streets to enjoy. Yeah. So yeah. this is a, a kickoff of, of rethinking that. Right, right. And it seems to, is this part of the Streets for People uh, initiative program? So this is one of the initiatives under that umbrella? Okay. Yes, that's okay. right. Yeah. Fantastic. Yes. So... Okay, well, we, we have this video uh, queued up. Let's play this. Actually, before we p hit play, um, why don't you give a little bit of an introduction? What is this, this, this video all about? So we created a series of videos to celebrate uh, some of the projects from the past year. I mentioned the 78 projects that uh, were rolled out across the country. Uh, and wanted to celebrate not just the changes that were made in the city, but the people who were involved in those projects. And uh, there were um, just incredible people across the country who poured their hearts into these projects. Um, and I think you can really see that come through in this video. It's a, a celebration of people in place. Fantastic. Let's hit play. So this is Drews Avenue and Rutland Street. It's kind of a, a really important heritage precinct in Whanganui and it's also a place where lots of arts activity goes on here and now there is a few new hospitality businesses starting to open up as well. We got the community together once we got the funding and ran three workshops, got them to actually walk the street and look at opportunities that they wanted to take up for creating spaces. They also felt confident because it was a temporary slash semi-permanent thing. They could be risk-taking in what they were doing. So we ended up getting quite a transformative design, which I think is the, the strength of tactical urbanism, is you can be quite experimental. So the main challenge was how do we create spaces that are nice to be in and have a, a, a focal point. So yeah, we really tried to focus in on these shelters and then the rest is sort of um, more in, in the street furniture side of things. There's been a lot of significant things that have come into the project like the large long tables giving multiple different people an opportunity to sit at one place and meet each other. We've got a really interesting variety of greenery. We've brought in a lot of play features so that families feel comfortable here and we've designed around environmental elements so that it felt like a really comfortable place to spend time in. The road art itself was this collaboration between Cecilia and Jody, who are both local artists here and they both wove together Cecilia's iwi designs with Jodie's retro designs and created this collaboration that speaks to how we can collaborate and work together and create something beautiful when we bring different people and ideas in one space. We were probably one of the, the original creative um, businesses here in the area and the opportunity to be part of this rejuvenation of this area has been fantastic. We showed our support by adding in our, um, our lighting outside the front to help illuminate and, um, yeah, and, and connect with the overall development of the area. Essentially, like, we just designed our cities for cars and along the way we just forgot about pedestrians and cyclists and, and common spaces, you know? Like, so I used to have just people sitting on my steps because it was literally the only place to sit. Now we actually have an area that we can all come together with our different businesses, chat, exchange, um, share our ideas and I can see that that will just sort of keep going in the future and will also be a hub for, um, for different events in the future. 
If you focus on what's being added, you can just see how good that is for your business. And I think that's what they're seeing here. One of the most important things for these projects to be so successful was that people are really willing to give it a go, whether it's the local community, the businesses, the artists, uh, the students, everyone that was involved in the Druzav project, the local council, everyone was so willing to give it a go that it really led to the success of the project. These businesses are really benefiting from it. It's really showcasing that there's things happening in this area and it happened in one month, which is amazing. Fantastic. That was really extraordinary. Yeah, I think it really, um, really helps us understand um, what the opportunities are with um, faster transition of our streets. And you can see there, um, that was filmed uh, about six months ago. Um, and uh, and people were out again um, after COVID lockdowns um, and really wanting to connect with people in their community. Um, it shows how important it's going to be for us to think about the flexibility of our streets to build resilience in our communities um, so that those important social connections can happen and, and people can get around um, places uh, that they need to get to in, in ways that are healthy for them. Yeah, yeah. The, a couple of things that really you know, caught my attention was uh, the individual talking about focusing on what's being added. Mm. That's, that, that's yes. classic. I mean, you know, from a human behavior <laughs> perspective, don't, don't focus on what's being taken away, focus on what's being added. The other thing that uh, um, jumped out at me was, one, it was wonderful to see the overheads, you know, to be able to see, you know, uh, in, in a much more profound way, uh, some of that street artwork that, that was happening. But the other thing that really resonated for me was uh, the one person, you know, coming in and saying how quickly it happened. It happened fast, mm. within a month. Yeah, you know, the things they absolutely. started noticing. We've, um, I think that was really one of the challenges um, of our, particularly our, our cycleway design and, and where it hit a town centre was the fear of disruption. And, and some of our projects do take years, literally um, several years to build. They might take um, up to six to eight years from planning through to opening um, a new project. And, and that's a lot of time for a community to invest. Um, so being able to feel and experience and understand the potential for change ahead of that, I think it's um, going to be increasingly important that, uh, that we can fundamentally reduce the amount of time it's taking to um, open up our streets, but um, ultimately to give people the opportunity to experience what it could be like. Um, I'm, I'm sure you've seen the same challenges that people have with reading and understanding a scheme when it comes out on a piece of paper. Uh, and that's, um, that can make change feel really scary, really challenging for people. Um, but being able to go out and have a look and um, talk to um, people about maybe this thing doesn't work, let's shift it a bit that way, um, gives people a lot more confidence in um, change happening that will meet everyone's needs and, and represent their community much better. Yeah, yeah. And also being able to not only, you know, be able to see that, that change happen and that transformation happening relatively quickly, but then also being able to see the positive results happening quickly too, because that, that's clearly Absolutely. part of the excitement that you, you saw from some of those business owners is that they were like mm. excited to see that this, the scheme worked, <laughs> you know, people are, yeah. are, are enjoying it. It's good stuff. Catherine, we're coming up to the end of our time. Is there anything that we haven't yet discussed that you want to make sure we leave the the, the listeners and the and the viewers with? I guess um, what's coming um, and what we'll start to see um, in in the next decade, um, we. We have some really challenging uh, targets for reducing um, 
uh, vehicle kilometres travelled in this country and reducing emissions. Uh, so we're, we're really starting to see fundamental system shifts um, occurring. Uh, we have a emission reduction plan uh, coming out uh, in May this year, uh, and that's, that's going to enable um, cities, towns across the country to uh, to start to increase um, the pace of delivery, really focusing in on on networks um, uh, being delivered, um, and the most effective way of doing that through reallocation of street space um, and creating uh, low traffic safe neighborhoods um, around our main street cycleways. So I'm pretty excited about uh, what's coming in uh, in the next decade uh, with creating um, streets that are open and accessible to everyone. So this, this work we've been doing for uh, the last couple of years through Streets for People and, and some of the big policy changes underway, that's creating, um, I guess, the, the scaffolding, the platform um, for, for the, um, the really exciting work to take off pretty soon, where we're going to start to see momentum build and, and a snowballing um, in our towns and cities. Um, so, John, hopefully um, our borders reopen um, mid this year. So in a couple of years' time, it um, be great to uh, welcome you here and show you around uh, some of the changes that are occurring um, in our towns and cities. It would be wonderful to host you. Oh, my. I look forward to it <laughs> for sure. Catherine, it has been such an honor and pleasure having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. The honor has been all mine. I'm such a big fan of your podcast. Thank you all so much for tuning into episode number 118 featuring Catherine King, the Urban Mobility Manager for the New Zealand Transport Agency. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, uh, share it with a friend and leave a comment down below. And if you haven't already done so, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just click on the button down below, ring that notifications bell to indicate what your notifications preferences might be. And uh, two last reminders before we part ways, uh, please be sure to check out the Active Town Store for some of my fun and zany uh, Streets Over People merchandise, like this fun water bottle here. And secondly, if you're enjoying the channel, please consider becoming a patron on my Patreon page. Every little bit adds up and it really helps me keep the channel going. Well, that's all for this week's episode. So until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. <laughs>